Good morning and good, uh, it's Spy Wednesday. Why they call it Spy Wednesday, I don't know. It's one of those holidays between uh, uh, Palm Sunday and, and Easter. This is the day that uh, uh, Judas supposedly made the deal with uh, the authorities, uh, the temple authorities, to have Jesus arrested on uh, Friday, <laughs> whatever. Uh, so, so they call it Spy, uh, spy Wednesday. Uh, jokingly, I said it's a, it's a feast day of St. Uh, Peeping Tom. Anyway, I don't vent very often, but I'm going to vent a little before uh, our talk this morning. Uh, people who write occult books don't make a lot of money writing the books. Probably the, the hours, the, the millions perhaps, uh, the thousands and hundreds of thousands of hours that they put into uh, uh, writing a book uh, doesn't if it was paid by the hour it would it would be fractions of pennies an hour even if the, the they're uh, uh, relatively good selling occult books uh, so you know you know i always shamelessly promote my books i'm going to shamelessly promote a couple more right now but it's not because i'm paying the rent with the sales of these books. I'm happy you you buy them. What's most important to me is that what I know, what I believe, and what I feel is my duty to express is important to me. That's why I do these things every, uh, every morning. And you can look at it as an ego thing. Go ahead. But to me, it's very important. And where the books are concerned, it's important to me that the publishers are happy enough with it that they keep it in print and that it stays in print at least a few years after I'm dead. Maybe maybe a lot of years after I'm dead. It's important that the publishers keep them in print. And one of my best books, in my opinion, was Homemade Magic. And the publisher was a fabulous publisher uh, and publishes uh, several more of my books, uh, Llewellyn. And if you have homemade magic, you're lucky, hang on to it, because they have let it go out of print several years ago. Now, I found another publisher, uh, but uh, it may be several years before it ever actually sees the light of day again, and it's one of my best works. So what I'm saying to you is if you're thinking that it would be amusing, at, at least, for you to, to uh, uh, read several of my books that you don't already have in your library, but you just haven't thought about uh, uh, actually buying it, or you think, well, Lon's only going to make, uh, you know, uh, 50 cents if I buy it. So I'm, I'm not helping him that much. It does help that much because I want the publishers to keep them in print. I want them to be relatively happy. And I almost guarantee you that you will not be unhappy to have the the book in your library.
So if you're if it's a toss up of whether you want to try to read something of mine that that uh, uh, you don't already own or perhaps think, well, I'm not interested in that subject. Think again and uh, and do me uh, do me a favor. Uh, because. I don't make a living making these these books, or at least not a not a not a good enough living. I have to do other things. Constance and I are on Social Security, even okay without that, and our Patreon support. Well, we're pretty much uh, at your mercy, and so I want the publishers to be happy. That's my little vent, okay. Um, Oh, two of those books that you may not have is this one, An Accidental Christ. And this is probably the, the one that uh, uh, most of you think you don't want to read because it's, it's Duquette writing a novel, but it's really fun and it's really good. And it, you will be amused if nothing, nothing else. But you'll also, I think, be edified, and it's very thought-provoking. And it's by that same publisher that allowed another book to go out of print. So if you're up in the air about getting Accidental Christ, buy a freaking six-pack of them, okay? Yeah, give them away to friends. Another book that thankfully stayed in print all these years is the one I'm going to talk about today because it's called The Key to Solomon's Key. Is this a lost symbol of masonry? Now, you might not be interested in masonry. You may not be interested in Solomon. You may not be interested in the Knights Templar, and you may not be interested in Goetia, because the whole second part of this book is a handbook of Goetia, including the, the all the spirits, the conjurations, all of that. Okay, why are these two things combined in one book because the whole front of the book is about the Knights Templar and supposedly what the Knights Templar bit of intelligence was that made them that gave them carte blanche for 200 years of European history. It's interesting. Why do those two things go together? Why does success in spirit evocation have to do with the mental and emotional liberation that can come uh, by one's attitude that's expressed legitimately in this this book by the philosophy of modern Freemasonry. Do those things go together? Yes, <laughs> they do. And uh, I try to briefly explain it in this little thing. My book's called The Key to Solomon's Key, Secrets of Magic and Masonry, or Is This the Lost Symbol of Freemasonry? It's really two books in one. The second section is devoted to the practice of Solomonic magic, known as Goetia, including lengthy excerpts from the classic text, The Lesser Key of Solomon. As a matter of fact, it's a full-blown handbook. You could learn and practice Solomonic magic with the information in that second section of the book. This is the kind of magic I've had uh, considerable experience with over the years. And for those of you interested in spirit evocation, 
This section of the book will provide you with my peculiar point of view on the subject, an abbreviated practical handbook. An important part of my peculiar point of view of why this kind of magic works is the idea that it takes a certain kind of person to pull it off. It takes a free person. A person who has freed himself or herself from certain psychological and spiritual restraints that prevent the majority of men and women in the world from realizing what kind of wonderful spiritual being they really are. Throughout human history, there's always been such people. People who recognize the fact that they are on a hierarchical ladder of spiritual beings. People who know there are levels of consciousness above them and levels of consciousness beneath them. People who realize they are not only free to climb this ladder, but indeed it's the purpose of life to attain higher and higher levels of consciousness until we reach the top and become one with the absolute consciousness. Call it goddess or God or the supreme being or the great architect of the universe or just the big what it is. All this seems very straightforward and logical to probably most of us listening to me right now who have no problem at all recognizing our birthrights as free spiritual beings. But how many of us can say the same thing about our two parents, or our four grandparents, or our eight great-grandparents, or our 16 great-great-grandparents? Most of us need only go back a generation or two to encounter ancestors whose spiritual self-identity and world view we would now consider as being nothing short of blinding and ignorant spiritual bondage. For the better part of 2,000 years, Western civilization has not only been spiritually asleep, we've been asleep and trapped in a nightmare. We didn't fall naturally into this terrifying slumber. We were pushed by individuals and institutions who for various perverse and malevolent motives needed to create a culture of spiritual zombies. You can find the weapon they used in the drawer of the end table of most hotel rooms. Be careful with it, it's loaded. It has the power to make zombies. And then assemble those zombies into mindless and brutal armies. Armies that for 2,000 years have drowned the world in blood, the blood of millions of men and women and children, and brought unthinkable suffering to countless millions more. It is the father of the slave trade and the mother of global warming. This weapon is deadlier than arrows and swords and catapults and guns and cannons and tanks and battleships and atomic bombs because it is the commander of the zombies who wield those instruments of death. I am, of course, talking about the Bible. And when we start asking too many questions about the Bible, we'd better be prepared for some unsettling answers. Now, I'm going to pause right here and digress to say the Bible isn't the only one of these weapons that cause the same effect, who have the same victims as the Bible does. But in this particular case, we're focusing on the Bible. I didn't intend my new book 
Well, it's not new anymore. To be controversial, at first I just wanted to explore the character of King Solomon for background material in writing about the kind of magic that bears his name. Part of Solomon's legend, especially in Islamic and Ethiopian religious texts, tell us he was a powerful magician. He's mentioned in a lot of magical stories from a, a thousand and one Arabian Nights. Solomon is a key player in the traditions of three religions. He's also the legendary patron of Freemasons. Other than what is written in the Bible and other religious literature, however, what exactly do real historians know about the political and military conquests and the glories of King David and the fabulous reign of King Solomon? What records have been discovered and preserved of ancient Israel? A mighty empire that the Bible tells us stretched from the Euphrates to Egypt. What ruins and archaeological digs can we visit to see the remnants of King Solomon's magnificent temple or the luxurious palaces he built for his wives? Structures many times larger, supposedly, than his temple. What great museums exhibit the helmets, the armor, the swords, the chariots of the massive and invincible army that conquered the Philistines, the Assyrians, and the Egyptians? Where can we examine the artistry of the sacred vessels of the temple? What archaeolog archaeologist has uncovered the tomb of David or Solomon, or, or a tablet or inscription bearing either of their names or the names of any of their kins and colleagues outlined so explicitly in the Bible. Oh, you, you might find recently to great, great fanfare, small pieces of notes or received saying something came from, quote, the house of David and the word house in it. Uh, is uh, means like the structure of a house and not so much the uh, uh, family heritage. Not only that, but the guy that came up with it has been proved a fraudulent fraud. Nevertheless, we're the museums and things like that, okay? As difficult as it may be for people to believe there is no archaeological evidence whatsoever to offer even the slightest suggestion that David or Solomon or Israel's golden kingdoms ever existed. No mention of the name of David or Solomon has ever been found in the mountains of surviving records that kept by the Egyptians or the Assyrians or those of any other neighboring nations who were allegedly defeated in battle and for years supposedly paid massive tribute to Solomon. No artifacts, large or small, from a mighty Israelite army. No object of art, no inscriptions, no letter either to or from either David or Solomon. No mention of either, either of them anywhere in the surviving correspondences of neighboring kingdoms. Most conspicuously, absent are any records whatsoever of what sh should have been seven years of taxes and labor levies for what the Bible suggests should exist for 153,000 workmen conscripted locally and from foreign countries to work on Solomon's temple. Documents which most certainly should be found in abundance among existing contemporary records. Considering the fact that the Holy Land is an area of the world where digging has taken place for centuries and thousands of artifacts have been unearthed attesting to the existence and chronicling the events, even prehistoric cultures in the area, is it not almost inconceivable, 
that such celebrated and powerful world rulers such as David and Solomon could remain so completely invisible to the archaeological record. Thomas L. Thompson, esteemed professor of Old Testament, the University of Copenhagen, writes, and I communicated with Professor uh, Thompson uh, in preparing this book. He wrote, in writing about the historical developments of Palestine between 1250 and 8, oh, excuse me, 586 BC. So from 1250 to 586 BC. All the traditional answers given for the origins and development of Israel have had to be discarded. The patriarchs of Genesis were not historical. The assertion that Israel was already a people before entering Palestine, whether in these stories or those of Joshua, has no historic foundation. No massive military campaign of invading nomadic Israelites ever conquered Palestine. There never was an ethnically distinct Canaanite population whom Israelites displaced. There was no period of the judges in history. No empire ever ruled a united monarchy from Jerusalem. No ethnically coherent Israelite nation ever existed at all. In history, neither Jerusalem nor Judah ever shared an identity with Israel before the rule of the Hasmoneans in the Hellenistic period, which is approximately 200 BC. Norman F. Cantor, himself a pious Jew and professor at Tel Aviv University, admits, quote, the first millennium of Jewish history as presented in the Bible has no empirical foundation whatsoever. I realize that for Christian Jews and Muslims, this will sound uncomfortably like heresy. Now get this, and please don't forget, don't misunderstand me. I'm not denigrating the Bible as a source of a spiritual text, and I believe it is possible that someday may be found evidence that supports these particular biblical accounts. Because I wasn't there, so I don't know. You may find evidence someday. I'm just stating a fact that any objective person willing to do a little honest research will today discover for himself or herself. That is, after centuries of excavation and impartial research, there is presently no tangible evidence to suggest that ancient Israel, King David, King Solomon, or his temple ever existed. That being said, I want you to consider the possibility that in the 12th century, 12th century Jerusalem, then first Knights Templar, nine men who were camped for nine years on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, nine men who had the exclusive opportunity to excavate the alleged site of King Solomon's temple, also discovered no tangible evidence to suggest that King David or King Solomon or his temple ever existed. Any number of discoveries could have led them to conclude that biblical history was at the very least unreliable. Perhaps their excavations demonstrated 
that a foundation for an edifice such as King Solomon's temple could not have possibly existed at or near that location. Perhaps they found tablets, inscriptions, or other records that proved incontrovertibly the real history of the region. It could have been a thousand different things. Cigarette packs, condom wrappers, <laughs> any anything. Okay, I'm trying to get the page turned in. <laughs> While I'm stalling with condom, King Solomon condom wrappers. It could have been a thousand items, artifacts, documents, or bits of information, no matter what exactly it was. Okay, it doesn't have to be the, the honey-pickled head of John the Baptist. No matter what exactly it was, if it proved, as impartial modern experts are almost universally asserting, that there was no King David, no King Solomon, no King Solomon's temple, at least not as described in the Bible, okay? then the entire literary foundation for the history of the Holy Land and ancient Israel prior to the 6th century B.C. would evaporate into fantasy. Like a literary keystone placed squarely in the middle of the chronology of the Judeo-Christian biblical narrative, the story of David and Solomon links and supports the narratives of both the Old and the New Testament. If the keystone is removed, not only does the historic integrity of much of the Old Testament collapse, but a major facet of the credentials of... New Testament Jesus is also radically altered. After all, in order to prove Jesus' birth was a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, that he was the Messiah and the heir to the Davidic throne of Israel, the Gospels go to great lengths to demonstrate that Jesus was a direct descendant of David and Solomon. Removing this keystone would be unsettling for pious Muslims who, despite their differences, consider themselves, along with Jews and Christians, to be people of the book. What would happen to Islamic traditions that also presumed to reach that far back into biblical history. In the 12th century, such faith-crushing revelations would have threatened to vaporize the authority of the Church of Rome and reduce to ashes the concept of the divine right of kings that had been the foundation of the social order in Europe and the West for a thousand years. It would have turned the world upside down. It would have been the most dangerous secret in the world. And it's my opinion that this secret and other equally damaging information concerning the early Christian movement and the Roman Catholic Church was the true secret treasure of the Knights Templar, and that it continues to be communicated today to those who have eyes to see and ears to hear in the rituals and the traditions of Freemasonry. And I go on to talk about that. But anyway, that said, thank you for allowing me to, to vent to this morning. It just uh, it just dawned on me that it was time to have that conversation. Anyway, until tomorrow, which is Monday, Thursday. Can't trust that day. <laughs> Monday, Thursday. I probably have something to say about Monday, Thursday, too, tomorrow. Until tomorrow, continue to be good to yourself and be good to each other. Do what thou wilt, shall be the whole of the law. 
Love is the law. Love under will.